Mina, Ohio Gazimas, Jesus Freaking Gamer here, and it is time once again for a Sunday message on Monday. I don't know what I'm doing. I guess I should be thankful it's only one day late this week. That's a crying shame. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better though. I'm a little bit more on track. Uh, this is the end of my Sunday doing uh, everything here at the beginning of Monday. Some of you guys are waking up and it's just like, it's, it's, it's Monday. What is this guy doing? Well, that's just, I'm a night owl. That's what I do. Oh, I do need to, I, it would be great to get these things out on actual Sundays. That'd be good. I'm going to keep working in that direction, y'all. Please work with me. I'm going to make this a part two to last week's message, God, Our Fortress. I don't know what I'm going to title the video yet. I'll make it up as I go. But I didn't get anywhere. Well, okay, I made some progress, but 30 minutes just was not long enough to get through this wonderful psalm. For um, your reference, it is Psalm 18 in the Bible. And in 2 Samuel chapter 22, basically they just laid out the psalm. Boom, here it is. So Psalm 18, take one. Well, I'll say yeah, even in the Hebrew Bible, psalms come after Samuel's. So I left off at verse 20 last time, so I'm going to resume with verse 21 this time. And we'll see how far we get. I've got my timer going. As it turns out, my recording software, OBS, has a timer on it. And since I am not playing a game, I can actually see OBS, so I didn't have to set my cell phone timer. So under two minutes, let's go. 2 Samuel chapter 22, starting in verse 21. The Lord awarded me or rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. My first thought is, that is a scary, scary thought. If I was rewarded according to my righteousness, I would honestly deserve hell. I have committed more than my fair share of sins. It's, I'm smiling because it's like, it's, it gets to a point where it's so bad you kind of chuckle at it. And really, sin and hell are not laughing matters. And I'm just like... Wow, how in the world could David say that? And all of this is written at the end of David's life. So it's not like David himself hadn't committed plenty of sins. It's not like there wasn't plenty on his record that needed that needed atoning for, needed um needed uh forgiveness for. So my default answer for this, because this is more of a question than a wow, this is so awesome, because I'm like I'm not the most righteous guy. I can't claim that. And at this point in David's life, he wasn't the most righteous guy either. So what's going on here? But righteousness, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. Righteousness is according to your faith in God. Do you believe in Him? Do you try to obey Him? Do you want to obey Him? The things that He has told you to do, at least... Maybe not every single law, but at least the things that he's told you to do with your life. Have you done them? He was called to be king. He was king. He made some really horrible mistakes. And he asked forgiveness for those mistakes. Could be wrong, but I think the righteousness that David is referring to here is the same righteousness that we Christians refer to in the New Testament. It's a righteousness based on our faith in God, not in some work we've done not in our lack of sin, but based on His righteousness, based on His goodness, based on His forgiveness. In that we can claim righteousness. In that we can claim cleanness of hands. And according to that, He, God, has recompensed David, me personally. You, if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, according to your faith, the righteousness He gives you through faith, he has recompensed you, and it's a good, it's a good reward. All the stuff I read last week, that's some really good, strong stuff. A God that is our rock and our fortress and our defender and our strength, who delivers us from enemies who are too strong for us, who pulls us up out of deep waters. It's an amazing award. It's an amazing reward. Verse 22, For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. I'm going to refer back to what I said in verse 21. He did wickedly depart from his God, but he asked forgiveness. And God forgave him, even of the horrible sins of adultery and murder. Even those sins were forgiven. 
because he believed in God and because he was genuinely sorry he had done those things. The next thought that comes to my mind is, so if you're genuinely sorry, you can get out of whatever it is that you've done, like everything's made right and okay. doesn't get rid of the consequences. Remember, David still lost the first child that Bathsheba bore him. Absalom stood up and rebelled against him. Amnon raped his half-sister. The sword never left David's house. It's not that there weren't any consequences, but God did forgive those sins. God genuinely forgave those sins. At the same time, in many, many ways, David did follow God. In many ways, David did exactly what the Lord told him to do. You read throughout First and Second Samuel as David didn't have a kingdom, started serving Saul, then had to go into hiding because Saul tried to kill him, then waited patiently for the Lord to judge Saul and eventually bring death on his head. He waited another seven years before the tri all the the other ten tribes of Israel joined the tribe of Judah and I want to say the tribe of Benjamin that was within Judah. If I'm quoting that wrong, I apologize. And then once he became king, he did he he went on and took more and more land for Israel. He went and conquered the Philistines who opposed Israel. He followed the ways of the Lord for most of his life. And it's like minus those two really horrible mistakes. And you can't just minus those mistakes. Those mistakes have to be genuinely forgiven. And the beautiful part is, he was genuinely forgiven. The same way we can be genuinely forgiven. If we ask God to forgive us and we mean it, if we believe in him and we really ask for his forgiveness, God does forgive us. It's for real. It's legit. That doesn't get rid of the consequences. That doesn't mean all the humans are going to forgive us. It does mean God forgives us. Yes, God forgives horrible things like adultery and even murder. God can forgive sins even as grave and as deep as those. And David went on to say, I'm just going to read verses 21 and 22 again, because in light of what David did, it's almost like a, bro, are you kidding me? So I'm going to, I'm going to read those two verses again. It's 2 Samuel chapter 22 verses 21 and 22. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Guys, if that's not a testimony of the forgiveness that God can bring in light, it, it, maybe I'm reading this wrong. Maybe he wrote this psalm and it had nothing to do and since it had nothing to do with the end of his life. Maybe this was written prior to the whole Uriah, Bathsheba, adultery, murder thing. Maybe I'm reading this wrong, but all this is written in Second Samuel at the, not the very, very end of David's life, but it's written very close to the end of his life. It's written, it's written after he, isn't it written after he's not able to go out to battle with them anymore? Yeah, it is. This is written, like, 1 and 2 Samuel are written chronologically. I'm not trying to waste time in the video here. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make this make sense. Hopefully that makes sense. That sounded kind of meta. Anyway, 1 and 2 Samuel are recorded chronologically. And so David can no longer go out to battle because he's old, advanced in years, and he simply can't do the things he could do as a younger man. He's not on his deathbed, but he can't go out to battle anymore. And then at the end of 2 Samuel, near the very end, and after it's written that um, he can't go out to war anymore, then this psalm was recorded in 2 Samuel. Maybe, maybe the Hebrew editor just had a really bad placing of this psalm, but I see this as a psalm near the end of David's reign. I see this as a... Let's turn to Psalm 18 real quick. Let's see if they, some of the Psalms have notes at the beginning of them. It's not like verse 1, but it's just a note at the beginning of the Psalm. And sometimes it mentions a little bit of context. Let's see what Psalm 18 has to say. 
It has a very large thing at the beginning. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, and then verse 1 of Psalm 18, on the day... And then, and then 2 Samuel 22, Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So even the beginning there is the exact same beginning of Psalm 18. Maybe this was written earlier in his reign. I don't think that everything I just said was without cause or without meaning, though. Hopefully this is an eisegesis. An eisegesis is when you're reading something into the text that's not actually there. But I really don't believe that this psalm would apply any less to David like prior to Bathsheba and then after Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. I don't believe this psalm would apply any less after all of that madness and after Absalom's upturning of the kingdom and Amnon's raping of his half-sister Tamar, I don't believe this psalm would apply any less because of the forgiveness that the Lord brings. Because of the forgiveness. His forgiveness and His grace are so amazing. And Psalm 51, where David does repent after the thing with Bathsheba and Uriah, God's forgiveness is quite amazing. I guess the best way to put it in perspective is David committed two sins, adultery and murder, which according to Old Testament law, he should have died. You could argue, well, he's the king. He's not exactly going to die. God could very easily take David's life. That's not exactly beyond God. God could have said, for these sins, you're going to die. You're going to pay the price of the law. And that's not what happened. You could argue what happened afterwards, the death of Bathsheba's firstborn, um, the way his family started falling apart. You could argue those things are worse than death. What I would personally argue is that God's forgiveness is amazing. And there's no and when Nathan pronounced over him, you are the man, you're guilty, then David said, I've sinned before the Lord, and then Nathan said, you're forgiven. I believe, I believe that the word of God is accurate there. I believe it's true. David sinned, and God forgave him. Yeah, there were some horrible consequences, but God's forgiveness was nonetheless real. And I personally don't think that this psalm, once again, applies any less after David's sin than before. I believe God's forgiveness, His mercy, and His love, I believe that those things can absolutely make up for all the sin and all the terrible things that we've done at any given point in our life. I feel like that alone is almost enough of a message. That that let's just let's just, you know, do an altar call. Let's just, you know, call people to repentance now. Let's call let's call for a faith and profession in Jesus Christ right now. But have more time. And this psalm is nowhere near done. But for those of you who are in deep sin, for those of you who think God can't use you anymore, the Bible contradicts you. You're wrong. God can forgive you. God can make up for those horrible things that you did. He most certainly can. If you will cry out to Him with all your heart, God will make, He'll set you right. He'll make you right in a way that only He can do. And that can, that can carry, you know, if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now, you go for it. That, that call is at all times available, and you can pause the video. You can turn off YouTube, turn off your computer, whatever you need to do. If you want to accept Jesus right now as your Lord and Savior, you by all means go ahead. If you want to wait for the end of this message, by all means, go ahead, whatever you want to do. But I believe, I, 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 this is the third time I've said it, and I'll make it the last one. Unless there are more verses that, that bring this up again. God's forgiveness can wipe away any of your sins. And this psalm that is said here 
somewhere near the end of David's reign, at least if you take into account that 2 Samuel is chronological, well, 1st and 2nd Samuel. This psalm means just as much and is just as true after David's sin as before David's sin. And if somehow it's not, if somehow I'm completely wrong having spent all this time saying this, if somehow I'm wrong, this only applies to the time before his sin, then David, I will say this, David had a lot to learn about God's forgiveness and God's grace because God's rewards, God's gifts, God's callings, they're dependent on what He's done for us and who He is, not what we've done. It's not the cleanness of our hands, personally. It's not us keeping the Lord's ways in our own strength. It's not us not wickedly departing from our God, because we do. And if all this was purely before David's sin, then David had a really huge wake-up call in the form of his own repentance afterwards. Because whether you want to accept my interpretation of that, I stand by what I've said three times, and if you don't accept that interpretation, please accept at least the plain words of Scripture where Nathan said, you are forgiven your sin. You're forgiven. It's so important because we're all sinners. We've all done things that are wrong. It's so important to accept that forgiveness. I don't think, I, I don't think I'll t just title this part two of whatever last week's message was. I think forgiveness will be more the focus of this one. Now, after all of that, we're going to move along. 2 Samuel chapter 22. This is in verse 23 now. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. A reiteration of verse 21. I thoroughly covered that. Moving along. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty, that you may bring them down. And it is important to note that David was a very merciful man. Again, he didn't take Saul's life. Even when he had two opportunities to do so, he refused to do so. David, was, as much as he was a warrior, he was also very, very merciful. And that is an amazing thing. That is, just to reiterate what Matthew 5 says, what Jesus himself had to say about mercy. It's very simple, but it's really good. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, I'm not saving, saying that David, because he was so merciful to Saul, saved his own life. How much that played in God's decision and God's judgment, I don't know. I do know that mercy triumphs over judgment. That's in the book of James. Again, Google is your friend for anything that I quote where I don't give you a chapter and verse. <clears throat> Forgiveness and mercy. Those are, some those are some beautiful, beautiful things. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. <laughs> you will save the humble people. So I am just... I'm reflecting on my own like my own life, and I'm just like, I'm so glad God has been merciful to me because I haven't always been humble, haven't always been blameless or merciful or pure. I've had my devious moments, and God's been just so overwhelmingly merciful to me. I am so thankful for the mercy of the Lord that I didn't deserve or earn one bit, except for through the faith I have in Jesus Christ who is righteous and who is good, who is humble, who is merciful. That being said, there's a lot, there is a lot to say when you are living according to the way of the Lord, when you are living in a merciful, blameless, pure fashion, there are many blessings that come with that. It is wonderful to receive the forgiveness of the Lord, and we all need to receive it at some point in our life, at, at the very least when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, where many were sinners in need of Him. But when you start living according to the Lord's ways, 
when you start doing the things the Lord wants you to do, there's a lot of blessing that comes with that. The merciful receive mercy. The blameless, the blameless man. The Lord himself is blameless regardless. So it's not, it's, it's interesting the way it's said that with a blameless man you will show yourself blameless. The Lord's blameless whether we're blameless or not. But the more we are blameless, the more we see him as the blameless one. The more we are pure hearted, the more we see him as the pure one. It's not a matter of him changing positions. I'm going to throw a big fancy theological word. God is immutable. And what that means is God never changes. God is, to, he is always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Google's your friend. God doesn't change. We're always changing. And I personally think that's a really good thing because humans, for the most part, we're in a position where we need change. We need to be moving. We need to be adapting. We need to be flexible. We need to be growing. As much as it sucks sometimes having to change and having to rearrange things, we humans are in a position where we need to be able to change. We need to be able to adapt. It's good that we're not stuck in a certain position here in this life. It's good that we're able to keep changing and thus moving forward. God does not change. But the more we change in his direction, the more we see him for who he is. Verse 29, For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. Hopefully, it, not trying to be self-centered or egotistical here, I'm hoping that some of the words that I'm speaking, I'm hoping some of the messages that I speak, as I speak forth the word of God, as I speak as I believe the Holy Spirit is giving me some utterance here, I believe there's some anointing here, I'm hoping that there is a bit of the light of the Lord shining through these messages. I know they're not incredibly viewed on YouTube at the moment. I know they're not like one of my most, they're probably the least viewed thing that I put out. And I still do them every day because receiving that light, having a lamp in a dark place is so incredibly important. And I believe one day, could be completely wrong, although I don't think I am, I think one of these days these messages are going to receive some views. I believe they're going to help some people in places where there is no light, where they don't see any way out, and they're going to see these messages, and they're going to be like, hey, there's a dude like me, there's a dude, you know, say, shares the same nature as me, makes this, some of the same mistakes as me. We all have our own personal temptations, our own personal pitfalls and stumbling blocks. And of course, I minister mainly to... Uh, just look at my opening. Mostly minister probably to otakus and weeaboos and video game addicts and all those wonderful people that I would call my, uh, my brothers and sisters. Not necessarily in Christ, but there's my brothers and sisters in video games and the love of Japanese culture dog on it. And I believe I'm going to be ministering to those people. I'm going to be shedding some light in the middle of some great darknesses. And I think these videos are going to be of great use one day. I'm glad I have a chance to talk about them. And I'm glad I have a chance to put them on YouTube. Well, and whether they're ever viewed or not, or whether they're viewed by many or by few, hopefully they're a blessing and a light and a lamp. And hopefully the Lord will use these to enlighten some people in the middle of their darkness. The Lord is that for His people. And the Lord uses His people to shine His light for those who don't know Him yet, for those who are on path to Him. Verse 30, for by you I can run against a troop, by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. So basically, David becomes Superman. <laughs> he becomes Superman when he's with his God. There's nothing he can't do, and I know I've had that feeling myself when I'm in the presence of the Lord, when I'm worshiping him, when I'm praying to him, and I've gotten that feeling of just being completely unstoppable. And I would dare say to anyone who's watching this who isn't a believer, who doesn't believe in any of this spiritual stuff, that it's so much more than an adrenaline rush, that God and His Spirit and His anointing are so real. It's not obvious at all times because we Christians, we do fall, we do stumble, we do make mistakes, and the church is unfortunately infamous for making lots and lots and lots of mistakes. But the church hasn't mistaken everything. We haven't, gotten, we haven't gotten everything wrong. We haven't gotten it all wrong. And one thing that I bank my very soul upon is the fact that I got Jesus right and God's forgiveness and mercy right. And I just want to extend my hand out to you right now.
put it in camera there so it's visible. My hand out to you right now. To anyone who needs Jesus, come and get him. You need God's forgiveness? Come and get him. You don't need to wait. Please don't wait. Don't wait to say, you know, well, let me just go a little bit farther. Let me just go with this grind a little bit more. Let me walk in darkness a few more steps, see if I can make it. Don't do that to yourself. If you've been in darkness, if you've been up to grind, if you're tired, if you're weary, lay all of those burdens down at the foot of the cross of Christ. He loves you. He cares for you. And you don't need to keep on struggling anymore. Not to say that everything's going to be peachy keen and hunky-dory as soon as you become a Christian. But there's going to be a peace in your heart that's going to enable you. And there's also going to be a change of your own heart that's going to enable you to go through these times in a way that you currently can't even imagine. And for those of you who are like, that's ridiculous, that's bunk, I don't want to hear it. Well, thank you for giving me so much of your time so far. Um, the rest of this is just going to be an invitation to those who want to accept Jesus. And for those of you who do, for those of you who do want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all you've got to do is believe that He's God, that He died for you on the cross, and that He rose again three days later. And if you want like a model prayer or something to follow, then pray these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I need your help. I admit I've done wrong. Please forgive me of my sin and my wrongdoing. I believe you died on the cross and you shed your blood to wash away all the bad things that I've done. And I believe you rose again three days later, guaranteeing me eternal life with you. Thank you, Jesus, for making me one of your children. Amen. If you prayed that prayer or something similar to that, welcome to the family. Welcome to the body of God. It's not perfect. It's not great. We've got a few things going right here. One is that initial relationship with God, which you just started, and that is awesome. If I can encourage you, find a group of people who believe similarly to you that Jesus is God, that He died on the cross, that He rose again. It, generally, you're going to find those people at a church. So try to find a church home, a place that believes those same things as you, because there's a lot of encouragement when you find people and spend time with people that believe the same thing as you do. Also, try to find a, a Bible that, that you can understand, for one. That, that's a huge help. I personally use the New King James Version. I love it. It's, a, it's much more contemporary English, and yet it keeps intact the message that the original Hebrew, American, Greek tried to bring out. So I love that translation. I personally recommend it. Find one of your own if it's not to your liking, but find a Bible and try to read a little bit of it every day. You want to learn who God is. You want to learn what he sounds like, the Bible's going to be your way of doing that. And also prayer every day. And it doesn't have to be like an hour in prayer. It doesn't have to be, you know, three hours in prayer. It doesn't have to be even ten minutes. Just, God, this part of my day sucks. Would you please tell me? That's a prayer. Something that simple is a prayer. Make sure to do that a little bit every day. And final also, last exhortation, Find some Christian music. and There's pretty much Christian music in every genre nowadays. Find some music in whatever style you like. Music that just says that Jesus is Lord. Music that acknowledges God's real. Jesus is there. The Bible is the Word of God. Find some music that can just encourage you and you can just kind of shout out a, you know, God, you're awesome. Have, have a few moments like that throughout your day and just pursue God. Now that you're His, Get to know him a little bit better. You'll find out he is an amazing person. And you'll never be the same. So thank you guys, one and all, for watching this video. I love you. God bless.